It's the seventh largest economy in the world, the third largest in Asia. So why are India's farmers killing themselves at an alarming rate? Hello, I'm Arun Naidu and this is The Heat. The numbers are staggering. More than 300,000 farmers have taken their own lives in India over the past 20 years. That's about one suicide every 30 minutes. Nearly 12,400 alone in 2014. Agriculture is the country's largest employment sector, yet farmers find themselves stuck in a vicious cycle of debt and poverty brought on in part by long droughts, poor yields and unseasonal rains. Many simply just give up. Later, we'll talk with several experts about what some are calling a deadly epidemic. But first, CCTV's Shweta Bajaj traveled to the Indian state of Maharashtra, where more farmers committed suicide last year than any other state in the country. Nearly two years ago, 23-year-old Kalidas, a farmer from one of the regions hardest hit by drought, committed suicide. Under the new insurance program, farmers paying premiums amounting to around 1.5% of a crop's value can receive full value if destroyed by drought or flood. The aim is to stop farmers like Kalidas from ending their lives. He borrowed $6,000 to install a pipe to irrigate the family farm, but drought had left no water to pipe in. It wasn't just crop failure that drove Kalidas to suicide. His father says it was the bank payments. My son took a loan. When the debt became too big to pay, the bank official started coming to our house. He was so stressed that he didn't think and committed suicide. In the state of Maharashtra, in a region called Maratwara, the situation is especially grim. There has been a sharp increase in farmer suicides in the region of Maratwara in the year 2016. They have gone up by a massive 85%. The reason is a combination of no rain and depletion of ground waters, which is pushing farmers to the edge. More than 3,300 Maharashtra farmers committed suicide in 2015. In the first two months of this year, another 57 farmers took their lives. After three years, the drought in Maharashtra is grave, with barely any groundwater left. Rajabhau Deshmukh, a Maharashtra farmer, says suicide rate is climbing. He blames the drought and poor education. When we studied why these suicides were happening, we realized that the number of small farmers that have small pieces of land is very large. They are uneducated and have no idea about the national economy. From the early 2000s, water has been a massive problem. Sometimes there's no rain and sometimes there's excessive rain, which destroys the crops. A farmer's economic condition is so bad that he has no will to live and kills himself. The region has struggled with this issue for decades, but it's receiving attention only now. In 1998, Yamna's husband committed suicide when she was two and a half months pregnant with their second child. After she gave birth to who was deaf and mute, her husband's family asked her to leave their house and fend for herself. For them, two granddaughters meant more mouths to feed and a dowry for their weddings. Yamna has been working in the fields to survive. The first few years were a nightmare, with banks asking her to pay her husband's debt. Money collectors from the bank used to repeatedly trouble us, but we didn't have money for food. Local money lenders also troubled us, and the interest kept going up. Now we just barely managed to make ends meet. India's new crop failure insurance was supposed to be available this month, the beginning of a new planting season. The question is whether it will help farmers already deep in debt and with no money to buy seed. Shweta Bajaj, CCTV, in Maharashtra state, India. Joining us via Skype from Chandigarh in India is journalist and food policy analyst Devinder Sharma. 
And with us from New Delhi, she focuses on development economics as a fellow with the Brookings Institution and is currently a visiting professor at the Indian School of Business. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Shamika, let me start with you. When we look at the number of farmers who are killing themselves in India, it's reached crisis proportions right now. They number in the thousands. Why are so many farmers resorting to suicide? Is there no kind of safety net? And is it just hopelessness that drives them to this? Well, if we look at the data, Anand, over the last 30 years, uh, the trend is showing that over the last uh, six to seven years, there is a downward decline. So on the whole, though the numbers are still very significant, uh, they seem to show a decline. So on the whole, maybe things are improving a little bit. But again, if you look at the overall the NCRB data, then it seems to suggest that poor health, mental and physical health, is one of the most you know, uh, commonly cited reasons in as many as 20% of all the suicides that are being reported. So it goes beyond agrarian distress. It, it's a it's broader uh, set of conditions. So Davinda, we hear that you know, a number of these farmers are killing themselves because of what Shamika just mentioned, uh, mental health, depression, things like this. But we also hear that one of the root causes that are causing farmers to kill themselves is money. They get themselves into this cycle of death. They can't get out of it. They see no way out. The only way out is to kill themselves. Well, I think, uh, first of all, let's be very clear that uh, as far as we understand, the, the number of uh, people committing suicide is actually not coming down. The government would like to play it down because uh, they want to show as if things are improving. But uh, what they have done in the formal data that they provide us is they have split uh, the farmers category into two, uh, which means uh, the land owning farmers and the landless farmers. So it gives an impression as if the number is coming down. But uh, very cleverly, it has been, uh, it has been hidden. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, my understanding of the entire thing is that, yes, it is uh, the mounting uh, debt or the, they are not able to get out of the, of the trap, uh, you know, which is laid out uh, by indebtedness. But uh, primarily, it is because uh, Indian farmers are paid uh, very, very less. They are deliberately being paid less. Uh, they are not being given the proper income. And uh, that is the reason uh, they have uh, no other option but to take more, uh, more credit, and uh, which uh, compounds the crisis. Uh, unfortunately, this is part of a global decision which is actually aimed at pushing farmers out of agriculture. So, so what is happening in India has happened earlier in America. Uh, they pushed farmers out of agriculture and uh, they provide huge subsidies to sustain those who are still in agriculture. But in India, the incomes are pathetically very, very low as a result of which the farmers are left with little choice. All right, Shamika, is that the problem? Farmers do not get enough money, so they go to these lenders where they borrow money and then they're charged exorbitant rates of interest? No, that, yes, I mean, you know, it would be nice to blame it all on the existing, uh, you know, hypothesis, which I think largely Indian media has clung on for now, what, 60 years. But you need to look at the data more categorically. First of all, in fact, I highly recommend that you read a report that came out of Brookings uh, as early as, you know, October last year, which looks at the disaggregates across different states, and if you compare states where the agrarian distress is actually quite severe, namely Bihar and UP, you know, the suicide mortality rate of farmers in these states is much, much lower than the relatively better states of Maharashtra and Telangana. So, you know, this theory of farmers on the whole being paid less, I think these are very simplistic and they actually, what they do is they crowd away, you know, attention away from some of the more important policy recommendations that the data is really pointing us towards. Now, another thing to note is that uh, what Devender pointed out, if you look at the trend over the last 15, 20 years is what I'm talking about. So it is not what the government did in the last you know, few years that I'm talking about. The overall trend over the last 25 years shows that farmer suicides are declining. So that, that's the broader context within which we must appreciate this problem. Uh, but again, uh, you know, health is, and health becomes, you know, it's across uh, mental and physical as an overriding factor. But then we have to go beyond. If you look at even Maharashtra and Telangana, what we see is that this, this entire phenomenon is really limited uh, in six or seven districts. And if you look at the, uh, you know, the land ownership across 
the farmers who are committing suicides, then you will see that it is not the highly indebted farmers of indebtedness or the debt to asset ratio, then you will realize that it's really the poor farmers who are indebted more. And yet, the suicides are actually happening amongst farmers who have you know, land ownership of above two acres or more. So it's, it's, it's all very simplistic, and I really do want to uh, uh, put this conspiracy theory which we've been clinging on for a very long time. This has to be put away. Right, so can you explain that to us? Because the conventional view is that it's the poor farmers, the guys right at the bottom rung of the ladder who are the ones who are committing suicide. But you're saying it's not the case. It's actually those who do own land, those who do have some kind of assets, they are the it ones committing suicide. So how do you explain that then? Why? Well, and, and the NCRB data is telling you it is largely health. It's mental and physical health. Now, even if you look at, again, within Maharashtra, where the uh, farmer suicides are much larger you know, than any other states in the country, you will see that if you just map the suicide rate across different land holdings, it's the better of farmers. Right. Devinder, would you agree and that to some extent it is mental health conditions? The fact that people could be suffering from depression, not just that, but they're not being treated for that. Uh, could that play, be playing a role in this? You know, the government also always wants to give an impression when there is a hunger death, you want to say, no, it's not because of hunger, it's because of, you know, you had uh, a problem with your, uh, you know, uh, tuberculosis or you had other kinds of diseases and ailments and so on and so forth. In the case of farmer suicides, also there has been an effort to really brand it as if it is not because of uh, economic crisis, but it's because of, you know, mental depression and so on and so forth. But let's be, be very clear, in, in a state like Punjab, which is the food bowl of the country, uh, has the highest productivity, even if you look at wheat, the productivity is higher than that of America. And if you look at paddy, it is almost matching that of China. And 98% of what uh, area is irrigated. And yet today, Punjab has become the uh, second most uh, important uh, hotspot for farmer suicides in the country. So I think we need to understand that it's not as simple as that. You know, it's, 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 it's very easy to say why farmers in, in, in uh, Eastern UP or, or in uh, Bihar are not committing suicide. That's also linked to the kind of agriculture we have brought in. You know, commercial agriculture, wherever we have been having more of cash crops, there are more suicides happening because the risk is tremendous. And as I said, because there is no no income base to fall back. Actually, he will, but whenever he suffers a health consequences, he has to, he has to, you know, more or more or less. Uh, I find they they go and commit suicide because he's a huge expense. Roughly about 40% of farmers' income goes into addressing the health issues. And what what income are we talking about? In India, you'll be surprised. 17 states of India. That's what the economic survey tells us. 17 states of India. The average income of a farming family is just 20,000 rupees per year. But this is the average. Now, what do you expect these farmers to do? 20,000 rupees, I think, uh, you know, would be, would be less than, uh, 50, 50, or let's say, I don't know, if you, if you to convert it into US dollars. But the point I'm trying to make is it's pathetically very low. And I think as long as we don't provide a higher income, I don't see a way out. Well, uh, Devinda, right. Devinda, the government is doing something about that. Back in March, they released their federal budget. Shimika, we'll get to you in a moment. Uh, the government released its federal budget. And it says that it plans to double the incomes of farmers within the next six years. Would that work? I think that's just to uh, you know give an impression or an illusion to farmers. I want to know if a man who's earning 20,000 rupees today per year, which means about 1,700 rupees per month, uh, per, uh, per day or uh, per month, right. 1,700 rupees. What do you want him to do tomorrow? Okay. How does he survive? I think that's the bigger question. The government does not want to give any money in the hands of farmers. If you look at the minimum support price increase, it is, it is again uh, something very shocking. Only 3 to 5 percent is the increase in the minimum support price for wheat and rice. And whereas if you look at the, the salary jumps for employees, the lowest employee in, in, in the government now gets a 260 percent jump in his basic salary. So these are the kinds of distortions that are happening in this country, which are okay. leading to farmers' uh, crisis in India. All right, let me go to Shemeka. Go ahead. So uh, I agree with Devinder there uh, that uh, the minimum support price should be uh, adjusted according to the inflation and, and other uh, macro uh, variables. But going back to the previous point, Punjab is one of the richest states and yet we're seeing uh, a suicide rates increase there. But we also know that Punjab has a very severe problem with drug abuse and substance abuse and alcoholism. So it's about time we started taking mental and physical health much more seriously rather than you know beating around the same old story of debt now in the past because we've had this debt narrative catch hold of indian media for the last and policy unfortunately most of the policy interventions in farmer suicide have been so limited to debt 
and we've had so many debt waivers over the last two decades, leading to no serious impact in terms of the numbers uh, of farmer suicides. So it's about time we really started looking at the disaggregate data. Now what Devinder talked about is the average farmer. It's true. Average farmer incomes are very low. But again, the disaggregated data is showing you that the farmer suicides are not happening for the average farmers, it's a of farmers. And that's, that's, and of course, I'm saying that you need to look at the distribution as a whole. And if the distribution is telling us that it's a better of farmers, it's the wrong intervention. Right. Debt it's waivers are not going to do anything more than they have done for the last two and a half decades. Yeah, Shamika, it still remains a crisis. We've got nearly half of all families in India on agriculture. Farming is the country's largest employer. Do you yes. believe that the Indian government is giving enough attention to this? I mean, on its priority list, where does this feature? Well, so we need to look at this, uh, Anand, from a couple of uh, points. One is in terms of the labor market itself. Now, agricultural labor, uh, thanks to the NREGS over the last 10 years, we've had a serious uh, upgradation and, you know, increase in uh, agriculture labor wages happening all across India. There is imp enough empirical research to support that has happened. But as far as, you know, other support systems, agriculture requires a lot of infrastructure and it is only in this budget in March that we have really seen this government moves, move its entire focus uh, into strengthening the rural uh, infrastructure. So my sense is, and by the way, these kind of infrastructure investments and programs there is a gestation lag so I don't think you know the current announcements of uh, March are going to have any you know immediate impact uh, but I think on the whole agriculture requires you know many more uh, interventions uh, and which is eventually going to uh, lead to you know uh, tackling the agrarian crisis it has to do with infrastructure it has to do with better uh, insurance and and Towards that, I think one of the largest crop insurance programs uh, was announced uh, in the last budget. Of course, as an economist, I mean, I have done some research in crop insurance, and, you know, globally we have seen that if the product is a standalone product and that to subsidize by the government the way it has been announced, you know, standalone crop insurance hasn't succeeded anywhere, Anand, globally. You know, in any of even the financially, you know, advanced economies, crop insurance don't work. Uh, so we need to find, because the measurement errors are, you know, uh, very high. So we need to find better instruments. And this is where I have been arguing that crop insurance, which is indexed to something which is easy to measure, like the weather, mm -hmm. rainfall, wind stir, all those different factors that really affect the crop. So we have to have a better product than the one we have announced. Right. Those instruments that you talk about, uh, let, let me go to Devinda on this. Would the government or would farmers be better off if the government actually addressed things like, say, the water crisis in India, addressed things like irrigation rather than talk about crop insurance uh, policies? Well, I would say that both are required. You know, we require crop insurance and at the same time an effective crop insurance and at the same time we require investments to be made in uh, various uh, uh, things that agriculture requires. There's no, but the fundamental question, as I've been saying every, everywhere, is that it's not the farmers who have failed. Actually, it is the economists who have failed the farmers. And it's because they, they are the ones who have not been suggesting the right to remedy for agriculture crisis. The crisis is because, primarily, it is because of income insecurity. It's an income crisis which nobody wants to address. You want to bring it by, by, by an indirect mechanism, saying that the crop insurance will boost your income or your, your, other, your productivity will increase your income and so on. This argument I've heard again, and I, I said, uh, said earlier, Earlier, Punjab is a classic example that doesn't work. Now, what, what exactly is the crisis? Is the crisis is of income. And I think that is what we don't want to address. Just because, you know, the mainline thinking is that farmers must be moved out, so nobody wants to do anything for agriculture. And then, you know, you want to create employment in these cities, the way you make them daily wage workers. And if that is the kind of a development process, I think there are bigger questions that right. need to be asked. Okay. But yes, I, I feel that, you know, in, in Europe and America, the farmers are surviving not because they are very productive, but because they're given tremendous income support. That is the reason why they're surviving. If you look at America, the average income of America American household in agriculture is about 150% higher than the, 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 the average in the, uh, the American households. So if you look at uh, uh, you know Holland, it is about 250% higher. Now that's because of huge subsidies, huge income support. I'm not saying that that's required or not required, but right. in India, we do not, we keep them popularized deliberately because we don't want to give them income. And okay. that is the fundamental question that we, whether it's a small farmer, whether it's a big farmer, everyone needs income. And income we are not providing to the farmers, they'll continue to die. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Shamika Ravi, Devinda Sharma, thanks to both of you for joining us.
We are going to take a break right now. When we come back, what more should India be doing to reduce farmer suicide? Stay with us, you're watching The Heat. that was a clip from a documentary produced by Action Aid, a global non-profit focused on human rights and poverty. Michael Kuhlman focuses on South and Southeast Asia as a senior associate with the Wilson Center for International Scholars right here in Washington. He joins us from there right now. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, farmer suicides are not a uniquely Indian phenomenon. We know, of course, that it happens all over the world, including right here in the United States, but written extensively about this issue in India. What makes it different in India? Well, what really sets apart this uh, very sad story uh, from cases elsewhere in the world is that there have simply been so many of them uh, and for such a long period of time. Uh, you know, we're talking about the most conservative estimates, something like 300,000 <coughs> farmer suicides in India uh, over the last few decades. And that's extraordinary. And to the, I really don't know of any other case, any other country where you've had that many cases. And again, uh, I, th I think that a lot of these farmer suicides are not recorded, are not reported. So there could actually be more than those. So it's just the fact that there have been so many of them over such a large period of time. That's what really sticks out. And of course, it's, it's, it's so tragic. Right. And when we look at what's behind it, you know, our two previous guests differed on that. The one guest saying that, well, look, it's, it's actually health issues. It's mental illness. It's depression. It's things that are not being addressed. The other guest felt that it was more concerned with money, the fact that farmers are not getting enough money. What's your take on that? Well, I mean, as with all complicated issues, with all major policy challenges, there's no simple explanation. And I think that there, there, there are various factors at play. One certainly is the fact that uh, you know, many Indian farmers are indeed poor and indebted uh, to the point that they become sufficiently desperate that they kill themselves. There are also uh, issues that are uh, much, m much more different, like uh, climate change effects, which has caused very severe weather patterns, including extended droughts, uh, which make it difficult um, for uh, Indian farmers to have uh, uh, successful harvests. Um, so you know, there's a combination of factors, and certainly, you know, health issues, you can't disregard that. Uh, my view is that there's just not one single factor, and I think we'll never really understand what really drives these farmer suicides, other than the fact that you have a, really a perfect storm of factors from, you know, climate change issues to um, uh, indebtedness uh, to uh, the fact that you just have a lot of uh, farmers that are not getting as much support, as much training, uh, and much, as much help as they, as they need to get through their very difficult plight. And you've also written that politics plays a role in this crisis. How so? Well, I mean, I would actually argue that farmers in India are not neglected by any means by the government. Farmers are regarded as a very important political constituency because there's so many of them. Uh, you've got something, something like 55% of Indian laborers are in agriculture. Agriculture is the key economic sector in India. So, um, you know, in fact, over the years, the Indian government has provided a lot of support, financial support, uh, loan programs, insurance programs. They've tried to be there uh, to help Indian farmers, realizing that they're an important political constitu constituency. And, you know, there was an election in the state of Bihar in India a few months back. Bihar is a very large agricultural state and a very poor state and the current government the the federal government the bjp did very poorly in that election and i think it took from that the fact that it needs to do more to help farmers so not too long after that election the indian central government uh, released its new budget and it was a budget that was very farmer focused so you know i don't think it's accurate to say that you know farmers in india are being forgotten and that their their plight is is being ignored by the authorities it's not but um, it's particularly because they're such a political, uh, a key political constituency. But the problem is so intense and complex that, you know, it'll take a lot more than throwing money at the problem, so to speak, to, uh, to, to, to make things better. And how does the media in India report this crisis? Uh, what kind of role do they play? 
The media actually reports it very heavily. Uh, you know, this story of farmer suicides in India, you, you hear very little about it uh, in the Western press, uh, and certainly not in the U.S. press, but it's actually reported very heavily in India to the point that many have uh, contended, many critics contend, that the media tends to sensationalize you and make too much of attention in of it, that you actually get cases that of, uh, of some farmers uh, realizing that, um, or essentially realizing that things are really bad for farmers and uh, even worse than they thought. What's the point of trying to make things better? You know, given what they're seeing on television and what they're hearing in, in the press, it makes them even more uh, disconcerted, more depressed. Uh, and also, people have complained that Indian media coverage tends to focus heavily on the compensation packages that um, are oftentimes provided to widows and families of, of farmers who, who kill themselves. And I'm not going to say I subscribe to this view, but there are some, some analysts out there that contend that sometimes there is an actual grotesquely, sort of sad to say this, an economic interest for uh, farmers to commit suicide and that their families would receive economic uh, support, economic compensation. Again, I don't know if I would go there, but the fact of the matter is the Indian media does cover uh, side issue very heavily to the point that some believe it, it could in some ways contribute to the problem. And talking about what the government can do about this, the government has approved a $1.3 billion insurance plan for farmers, crop insurance. Um, those premiums will be discounted, but can farmers afford something like this? Well, I mean, th this is the thing, that uh, th there have been so many different schemes, so many different insurance schemes, supportive plans to try to assist farmers uh, in India. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that... Uh, the problem is so deep and uh, so many of these Indian farmers are so impoverished that they're not going to be able to, whatever they receive is oftentimes not enough uh, and a lot of times you have uh, these expectations that they would pay uh, a certain amount for loans that it just, it, it, it doesn't work for them and the problem here is that uh, you have a number of Indian farmers that are desperate for loans and instead of going with the credible um, banks that will provide loans and, and, and that's it, they'll go for these cheaper intermediary, unofficial, informal type um, uh, lenders. And these are the ones that tend to be very problematic in that they oftentimes will uh, try to force uh, farmers to pay back uh, their loans more quickly than, they, than they're supposed to. They'll threaten them to harm them. And, and some have argued that uh, part of the farmer suicide uh, epidemic is rooted in the fact that you have a lot of farmers that are essentially hounded to death by these disreputable uh, lenders. So, and this all comes down to a, to a financial issue. The, these farmers can't afford more expensive lending agencies, and so they're stuck going with these less credible ones. Right, and on some of the solutions being proposed, uh, one of the solutions is uh, community farming. What exactly would that entail, and how would it work? Would it address the crisis? Well, certainly, I mean, uh, the, the idea behind community farming and, you know, if you want to talk about it, something like organic farming is that there's, it's simply easier to do, it's less expensive, there are fewer inputs. You don't need as much stuff, you don't need as much technology, you don't need the, the pesticides and all that stuff, and the idea is that would bring costs down. So it certainly is a good idea. Um, but the bottom line is that with community farming, organic farming, sometimes the yields are not as high, uh, and it, it takes a longer time to achieve. And of course, a lot of these farmers, they, they need yields. They need, they need to make money. They need to sell their, their crops off. And if they're focusing on these lower scale type methods of farming, it's not going to be uh, a very useful um, uh, situation for them. It wouldn't really resolve their, their financial problems. But it is good in theory. It's a good idea. Thanks, Michael. That's Michael Kugelman talking to us from the Wilson Center. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.